Hey guys, welcome back to our YouTube channel. It's a girl Fanny Lungu back with another reaction video. If you're new to this channel, make sure to give this video a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and of course, do not forget to subscribe. A big shout out to everyone that has subscribed to our channel so far. Thank you for subscribing, liking, sharing, commenting. Everything that you guys do never goes unnoticed. I hope you guys are doing alright and may you stay blessed. A big shout out to the person that suggested this. So without wasting time, let's get into the video. Um, how does a religion assert itself authoritatively when the purpose of religion is actually to unite people and not to separate them? In other words, if you have a religion where all of the people are differing about what that religion is, how is that going to bring them together? They're going to end up fighting each other, disputing over it, creating their own sects. You can see, for instance, in this city, there are probably hundreds, if not at least uh, dozens of churches of different denominations. And this is what happened to Christianity. It's split up. You will see within this, on this hill, many different types of Christianity are being taught in these colleges. Judaism. You can go to a reformed synagogue. You can go to synagogues in Judaism where it's not considered necessary to believe in Yahweh. You don't have to believe in God. You can still go to the synagogue and be part of a, a Jewish religious community and not believe in God. And, and I learned that from being in an interfaith dialogue with a rabbi who didn't believe in God. Because I said, well, we have the commonality of God. He said, no, we don't. I don't believe in God. And it really shocked me. But, I, you know, I went back and I did my research and found out, indeed, that there are reformed versions of Judaism that do not stipulate a belief in God. That it's more of an ethnic, cultural, binding tradition, religio. So it's purely on a horizontal plane. There's no vertical reality to the religion anymore. So you can, you can find all these differences. Now within the Islamic tradition, you can be a progressive Muslim. You can be a transgender Muslim. You, there's all these different types of Islam out there. And this is part of the fragmentation of the time we're living in. And so the question about authority, how did Muslims deal with this? Because again, one of the things that we can learn from the ancients is that they went through the same things that we're going through. They had authority problems in the early part of Islam. They went through their own types of disintegration. They went through their sectarianism, their schisms. Right? The Sunnah Shia split is a schismatic split. And the Prophet said that you will split. He told us that. It's, 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 it's human nature. But then he said, but one group is guided. So everybody, if they're all claiming that, how is that claim substantiated? Because the Ismailis claim that they have the Baltani authority, and this is what gives them the truth. The Shia claim that they have the Al Bayt authority of the unbroken chain of the 12 impeccable Imams that can't make mistakes. Within the, uh, the Alawi or the Nusayri, also a sect, a radical sect of uh, the Shia tradition claims that they have uh, a direct line to Ali who's uh, an incarnate like the Logos, like Jesus. So you have all these different competing claims. What substantiates them? What legitimates them? What enables us to discern Haq from Batil, the Furqan? What is that? And somebody was talking about assumptions earlier. It's a problem because we assume many things. Most people were simply born in a place and they take on the histor histor historical, cultural nature of that place they were born. One philosopher terms them historical products. They're products of their historicity. And so they're trapped in uh, a religious, ethical, social, economic, situation that determines everything that they're going to think about those things. 
And so we live in a time where people have prepackaged ideas that they, the, and, and the really the great leisure domain of the time is to make people think that these are their own ideas, that they came up with them themselves, that this is some kind of self-actualization, that I, I, I believe these things and, and I came to these conclusions myself. Everything's relative. You can trace that, that there's a senate with that idea. That has a, a lineage, and you are in a chain of transmission when you make that statement. And we can trace that chain and see who the first people that said it were. If you say there's no God, there's also a chain of atheists. You're in a chain, you're in an isnad. Whatever position you take that you think is uniquely your own or original, you are in a chain of transmission. Now, from our perspective, and, I, and I'm talking about from believers, whether you're Christian or uh, other traditions, because almost all these religious traditions do believe in, uh, in a dark realm, those chains either go back to demonic sources or they go back to angelic sources. So either Iblis is at the end of the Hadethani Marx on Hegel, and, right, and <laughs> you go back and then Iblis was the first Rawi in the chain. And so that's your chain. It goes back to Iblis. So you're a transmitter of narrations from Iblis. He's your source. But people don't recognize that. Or you go back to Hadathani An Fulan, An Fulan, An Fulan, An Isa, Ibn Mari An Jibril. Right? Or from God. So these are the these are the these are the basic the two fariqun fil jannah wa fariqun fil sa'ir. Those are the two chains. You're in one or the other. There's no other chain in dunya. You're either in the chain of Iblis's transmission or you're in the chain of prophetic transmission. Now Iblis, people forget, you see, that the occult, people don't want to deal with the occult. The occult is everywhere. You're dealing with occultic phenomena everywhere. There are occultic elements in the way San Francisco was designed architecturally. There's a reason why Pier 33 is the central pier in San Francisco. There's a reason why there's a pyramid embodied in the actual street structure of San Francisco. Washington, D.C. is designed in an occultic uh, design. Why? Because there are people that have religious beliefs, spiritual beliefs, and those spiritual beliefs impinge the way they see the world, the way they act upon the world. All, all you have to look up is John Parsons, one of the most important people in uh, rocket science, developed a type of fuel that enabled the, the whole telecommunications period, and he was an open worshiper of whatever you want to call that dark force. He was open about it. It's on his Wikipedia site, and you can, there's books about it. So you have scientists that are in the occult that are at the highest levels. You have people in government at the highest levels that are in occultic rituals. I mean, this is part of the world. The Christians have a, a saying from Paul that our battle is not of the flesh and the blood but it's with the principalities of darkness. And so if you want to know who's behind Syria, it's not the Alawiya, it's not the Iblis is behind that situation. These are dark forces working to destroy people's homes, to destroy their lives, to destroy their livelihood, to make them suffer, to put them into a state of despair, ablasa to make them question God. Where's God? How could there be a God? How could he let little children suffer like this? These are the questions that Iblis always poses. And people in weakened states, when their faith is low, when they're suffering, they will succumb to those demonic insinuations. This is called Telbisu Iblis, the dupery of the devil. Telbisu Iblis. So the Isnad is the way in which a normative, and 
if you study academic religion, they talk about descriptive and normative religion. There is a modern argument that many, many people in religious studies uh, would like to to put forward or do put forward, and many, many religious studies programs are rife with this concept that there is no such thing as normative religion. There is only descriptive religion. That normative religion is a fantasy. That whatever the religion might say about itself, it's never that. If you, if you chip away at the formica of a South Asian Muslim, you will hit the bedrock of Hinduism. Hinduism has never left the subcontinent. And we'll, we have scholars in the 19th century that wrote all the Hindu influences on the Muslim culture in South Asia. If you go to Morocco, you will find pre-Islamic pagan rituals still being practiced within Moroccan Islam. So they will argue that, is, that any religion that ever claims to take root in reality, it's just another patch on this quilt of human behavior. And so if you look at Christ Christianity, they celebrate Christmas here on December 25th. That was the Roman sun god's birthday. Mithra. They have Christmas trees, Noel Tide. What does snow have to do with Palestine? <laughs> what does Santa Claus have to do with Palestine? Right? But but this is this is basically how religion manifests in human societies. It manifests with a lot of different streams flowing in, tributaries that are enlarging the river of religion. The same is true in, if you go Tibetan Buddhism, Tibetan Buddhism is, 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 there's a Tibetan mask on Bon animism, which is the previous religion that was in Tibet before the Buddhists got there. It's filled with, with uh, animistic pre-Buddhist rituals and beliefs. And so Islam is no different. You will find many, many uh, beliefs that came into Islam or were already in the previous cultures. The Muslims were heavily in influenced by Hellenistic tradition. The Greeks had a massive impact on the Muslims. I mean, they, they come up against the Greeks. The Arabs say, that wisdom came down on three, on the intellects of the, the Greeks, on the hands of the Chinese, because they were great uh, manufacturers and on the tongues of the Arabs, but the, the Greeks had a huge impact on the Muslims. I love how realistic the information in this video was. Nothing is ever as it seems. There's always a beginning to something. The now is what we're experiencing, but there's also a history to our now. Let's, let's not ignore that. There's many things, if we go back to our roots, that we're going to discover about different religions. Some of the things are going to be shocked. Some are still being practiced, and some have even been re removed from religion and the number 33 what do muslims think about the number 33 do you think it's bad do you think it's good or do you think it's just a simple number as it's supposed to be otherwise i really love this i really really enjoying this because it seemed so so real something that we want to hear on a daily basis not just uh sugarcoating each and every information that's being put out there everything has a history you have a history i have a history religion has a history but it doesn't mean that even if our history is bad or good it should determine what we are now what different now and things change otherwise i really really enjoyed this if you have any comments concerning this video feel free to comment in the comment section below i'll be more than glad to read um your comments uh, make sure to give this video a thumbs up, share it with your friends and of course do not forget to subscribe and I'll see you in my next reaction video.